you know, it went through my mind, similar to what we saw in the Sugar Bowl with Ole Miss quarterback Matt Corral. It was late in the game that Tyler Linderbaum was, I believe, taken out of the game for a play. Turned out to be that he was okay, and I think he came back in, but I just thought, he oh, came, my goodness. He came back in. Somebody asked me, why would you come back in? Dude's insane. He's a, he's a big Hawkeye. I love the guy. I mean, he's just a great now. You may say he's endangering his his draft stock. I don't think he would have went in had he had there yeah. been any doubt that he was going to be okay. Yeah, but that just shows what kind yeah. of person he is. And um, I know Kyler shot slid over to center. That center is a question mark, uh, Mark, because heck, with with that injury, I, I expected Matt Fagan, who had been listed as the backup center all year, to come in for Tyler, and it was Kyler shot who slid over. So that makes me wonder, do they not have confidence in a backup center right now? So that would be another big uh, question mark on that line. Um, the fourth down and one mark, um, you know, I, I said after the game, I, I wanted them to go for it. My first inclination was punt because the defense is playing well enough. Sure. Um, you don't want to give Kentucky a short field. I get it. But then I, I reflected on my own words that you and I had discussed as far as just that changing mindset wanting to change the mindset to being aggressive and go take the game go win it as opposed to uh, trying not to lose and so I was hoping they would go for it when they lined up for it I thought okay they're going but there's a couple things that went wrong there a they didn't snap it which you can argue was still the right decision to punt but you do not take a timeout in that situation and you probably noticed it and coach Patterson brought it up right away that that's just inexcusable to use a timeout in that situation, it's it's the same story. It's it's putting all your chips, all your hopes, all your chips on the defense because if we don't have the we're 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 not conserving timeouts. We're not doing anything to plan around us needing a last minute drive, and you just take a penalty and you would be in the same position. They had a touchback on the punt anyways. Yeah, so everything you just covered points to why that was the wrong decision. So first and foremost, they were around their own forty, correct? Yeah. And so they're one of the range. best punters in the country. One of the best punters in the country. If, if I'm going to quote Corey Bratta from earlier shows, the best punter in the country. Probably, there's a lot of good punters out there, Mark. There are a lot of good punters out there. There are. Uh, that that position as well has been upgraded considerably in, yes, in college football in the last 10 years. Um, so my first thought is that you know I'm, I'm typically working the percentages, and I don't want to say I'm anywhere close to Don Patterson's level when it comes to that by any stretch, but that's, that's kind of my first line of thinking. Okay, they're at their own 40. What type of game is this? Who do, you, who do you lay your confidence in? The offense, defense, their offense, their defense, all those things. Um, and we're talking about a, you know, there, there is a somewhat of a difference, a percentage difference between, let's say, if it's fourth and a half yard versus being like fourth and two. Uh, it's, a, it's just a different play. So they were around fourth and one and a half, something in that range. Correct? No, it was less than one. It was fourth and about okay. two feet. Was it that short? Yes, it was. Okay. Okay. All right. That's a 85% certainty of gaining the first down. I would say something in that range. So I think you, and, and even if you don't get it, no, that that's that's potentially a game deciding mistake. But it's not guaranteed. You're you're no. still you've got that you've they got. They needed a, a touchdown, is, Mark. Yeah, they needed exactly. They needed a touchdown. They didn't you've need got a, a really good defense. They've got a decent offense. It's not prolific you're still, you haven't lost the game, but you can with about six minutes left. How much time was left? No, the there game? was under four, just under four. That's right. That's right. They were in the 340 range. You're going to not ice the game, but man, you take a major step toward icing the game, considering all those other factors. And to your point, once they decided, now... <laughs> I'm, I'm going to steal your line here about putting all the eggs in one basket, how much it's worth trying to get the defense to jump off sides. It happens enough where the attempt, I don't have an issue with the attempt, but that probably happens 15 or 20% of the time. It usually doesn't work, but it works enough to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't work, you can't waste the time out with three and a half to four minutes left because you don't know if they're going to score with 
45 seconds left in the game and you need a timeout, uh, but still have time to, to get it done. And then number two, with a, with a punter, why not give him the full field and let him just sail that thing? Well, and the other thing is too, not saying this would have been the best decision, but if you're going to call a timeout there, then go for it. So if you're going to use the whole clock to try to draw them off sides, fine. And then you're going to call a timeout, but you better darn well go for them fourth and one. It makes no sense to call a timeout and then punt. Um, you could even argue, you know, try to draw them off sides and then go for it with a second or two left on the play clock. But the bottom line is Kirk Ferentz had no intention of going for it on that play. So, you know, as far as changing mind, there was no, we, we, we've been talking ever since the Michigan game about how Iowa needs a different mindset offensively. They had about a month to, you know, conject and figure out what the, the the mindset was going to be. If there was going to be a changed mindset and a month's not a long time, but it gives you an indication of where does Iowa, where does Iowa believe it is offensively. There was no change in mindset on that. That's, like, that's the same thing. And I, I saw uh, Hayden made the comment too in the chat clock management issues. I, I'm going to be hitting that really hard this off season, Mark, because we talk about quarterback and we can talk about play calling the clock management issues in Iowa are almost maybe they might be the most disconcerting thing behind the the lack of uh, acknowledgement of our quarterback issues because it's every game. It is every single game. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. And I brought it up during um, the post game show. And, and I don't, again, I know you watched part of the game. You watched all the fourth quarterback today, but uh, you go to the end of the first half I'm trying to recall this to my brain here, but Kentucky had first and 10 at the 11. All right. Uh, Clock was moving. Okay. Clock was moving with about a minute 50 to go. That's when they moved the change to the 11. Now, Iowa, I believe, had at least two timeouts. Maybe had three, but I think I had two. Uh, No, I believe maybe they did have three. Regardless, in that situation, you call a timeout. You call a timeout because Kentucky is no longer concerned about the clock. You know that, Mark. They're no longer concerned about the clock. The entire playbook is open. Now, could they potentially get a first down at the one and then need four downs? It's possible, but is it probable? Absolutely not. So just logic, basic clock management logic tells you you take the timeout, you burn your timeouts because regardless if they get a touchdown or they don't, there's no reason not to use your timeouts in that situation to conserve time for you. And what did they do instead? They let the clock run all the way down and then Kentucky scored as we knew they would. And then Iowa got the ball back with about 35 seconds in the first half. I mean, that, that is just, un, it's just inexcusable. There, there is no rhyme or reason for that. So I understand maybe you're maybe I think it's clearer. The coaching staff doesn't think in terms of clock management but I think it's it's it is Kirk's responsibility this off season to take a lo- good long look at that and say, okay, how can we fix that? We've got to put somebody in charge of clock management, whether it be Lavar Woods or it's Ken O'Keefe. Somebody needs to just that needs to be their job, and no one else's. No, there should be no one else. And I know that's a perfect example. Don Patterson. Don Patterson was a, uh, considered an expert, and I believe it was. So I'm thinking of Diaco okay. at UConn okay. and Don telling me the story about Diaco and Diaco. I believe it was Diaco that put Don in charge of clock management. He said in a, in a staff meeting, he said, Don, Don is in charge of clock management. Ain't nobody else going to be questioning him. This is his job because he knew Don knew what he was doing. And clock management, although we make it out to be simple, it's a very, Don's talked about, it, it's a very right. complex thing. There are a lot of just, uh, as far as mathematics and just situational things that you need to understand. So it is a project, but it doesn't seem like we have much of an understanding of how to manage the clock. And it happens almost on a game by game basis. Um, And then decisions just, I mean, we bring up the Purdue game. You're at, you're near midfield. And I think they took a knee heading into halftime at midfield. I mean, what, what are we doing? What are we not going to even take a shot? (laughs) It just doesn't make any sense. So um, again, I want to really focus on that this off season, but that was yeah. another thing. And I know it sounds like we're just hitting the same things, but Mark, these things came up in the citrus bowl, the same things we've been talking about since the Michigan game reared their ugly heads in this game. Unfortunately, they absolutely did. And, um, yeah, the, the one, well, as I'm playing along with the clock management during any game, 
the the one difficulty that I find above any else is the determination. And this this almost changes play by play within you know that last minute to ninety seconds uh, of a first half in particular. Obviously, if it's the game, then you either win or lose. Unless it's a tie game, then you got to determine uh, the success of your offense versus giving the ball back. But exactly that, trying to determine, okay, are we conserving time for our offense and the success of this drive? And then at what point, okay, now it's second and 16. Are we then determining it's going to be difficult for us to succeed and we no longer want to conserve time? Just making that judgment uh, is, is, is to me the most difficult as I've played along through the years. And, and you're right. It, so it's not a, it's not always a cut and dry situation. Um, unfortunately, what I, what I struggle with, with Iowa is Iowa has a problems with the cut and dry situations. So it's not the complex issues or the comp- complex situations. It's the easy ones. The ones that should be obvious that are obvious to the common fan. Uh, and so, you know, again, I, I th- that's a concern. Um, I will say this, a perfect example of willingness to change. Last night in the Iowa-Maryland game, uh, we observed Iowa up by three. Jordan Bohannon missed the front end, or excuse me, the back end of a, of a uh, two-shot uh, trip to the line. So he missed the second free throw. Um, and Fran McCaffrey instructed Tony Perkins to foul up by three. Now there was like five or six seconds left, but as you probably know, Mark, that's been sort of a debate. If you want to call it that coaches have different philosophies about, do you foul up three or do you just play it out and defend the three pointer? And for as long as I can remember it, Fran has played it out. And last night we saw him foul up three and they won the game. It's a perfect example. And people can say what they want about Fran McCaffrey. You know, he, he loses his cool at times. He's maybe not as, as warm and fuzzy as Kirk Ferentz, but I give him a, big major attaboy because that was a change in philosophy. Um, And again, I think it's the right change in philosophy. And so again, you can change things and not lose who you are. So maybe, maybe coach Ferentz could take a a little bit of a uh, something out of the book of Fran McCaffrey from last night. I am far from a basketball expert, but what used to drive me nuts would be the two point deficit for the team that has the ball game winning type situation or game tying type situation. And the point guard invariably most of the time waits too long to start the play gets into trouble. Doesn't, you know, waits till seven, eight seconds. And he's still somewhere halfway between the top of the key and half court. So this is what I would typically find. They start the play too late. And he dribbles around and then he settles for a jump shot. When you go to the rim and you force the defense to make a play, you force the officials to make a call. That's typically the way to go is to go to the basket. Yeah. And the chances when, especially with just the rules and rules on verticality and whatnot. Now there are going to be sometimes that those calls are missed, but uh, yeah, your chances of getting to the line and your chances of being able to put the ball in the basket are much higher. So now you're right. And and again, there are coaches that feel different ways. I mean, I'm frustrated with some things Fran does, but again, going back to that situation specifically, uh, I'm proud of him doing that. So maybe Kirk will do that. You know, I, I don't know. It wasn't that long ago, Mark, that maybe you don't remember this, but people were calling Kirk Ferentz in like 2017, 18. They were calling him new Kirk. Do you remember that? Everybody <laughs> was calling him him. Everybody's calling him new Kirk. Because he started to go for it on fourth down more, and he started to run some trick plays on special teams. Well, a couple things. The the trick plays have gone bye-bye. They don't run trick plays anymore. It's funny, Riley Moss made a comment during bowl prep that, man, it's really it's really annoying. It's really irritating because the, def- the offense has been hitting us on some trick plays during bowl prep. And all the Iowa media gets all excited about it and has to be on Twitter, you know, first and foremost. And then, of course, we go to the game and not a single trick play. Now... I know Don kind of set me, put me in my place. He said, well, the reverse to Arlen Bruce for a touchdown was technically what we'd consider a trick play. But I guess, again, <laughs> that's a, a play that Iowa has ran. I, I don't consider it a trick play. I'll take Don's word for it that it is. But um, 
it's just it, again, it's I go back to the word conjecture. It's just a lot of talk and hype. It's just like the who's going to start. And Kirk Ferentz said a couple days before the game, "Well, you'll find out who's starting at one Eastern on Saturday." And again, ooh, what a clever Kirk! <laughs> it's like, come on, man, what are we doing? It's just a lot of talk, uh, and so you hope that it gets to the drawing boards this uh, this off 